This Filmmaker IQ lesson is sponsored by ICANN, award-winning designer, manufacturer, and distributor of professional video, film, and broadcast production equipment. And by Blackmagic Design, creating the world's highest quality solutions for feature film, post-production, and television broadcast industries. Hi, John Hess from FilmmakerIQ.com. Today we'll dig into the science and history of popcorn and how this delicious treat helps save the movies. Ah, the magical sound of corn popping. But what is it about this seed that makes it explode into fluffy, flaky goodness? Popcorn is a species of corn called Zea maize everta with a very interesting characteristic. Unlike most grains, the pericarp or hull of the popcorn kernel is both hard and impervious to moisture. Inside the seed, the endosperm is made of a hard, dense starch with a little bit of water and oil, ideally around 14% for good popping corn. That little bit of water makes all the difference. When popcorn is heated, that water turns into steam, but it can't escape the hard waterproof shell. As the temperature increases, the steam pressure builds and builds, and the starchy insides turn into a hot molten gel. At around 356 degrees Fahrenheit, the internal pressure is 135 pounds per square inch. At this point, the shell erupts and the molten starch expands quickly, rapidly cooling and forming an airy foam. This creates a starch and protein polymers of that familiar crunchy puff. In the industry, there are two kinds of popcorn flakes. Butterfly flakes are irregularly shaped pieces with wings. This is considered to have a more pleasant mouth feel and is generally used for movie and everyday snacking popcorn. Mushroom flakes take on a more ball shape, making them less fragile, often used for pre-packaged popcorn and confectionery like caramel corn. Popcorn is perhaps the oldest snack food known to man, with evidence of popcorn being found in the Bat Cave in western New Mexico dating back to 3600 BC. The origins of popcorn as a species are not entirely clear, but it seems to go hand in hand with the domestication of maize by early Central and South American inhabitants. In fact, the English word corn is somewhat misleading. Corn originally meant whatever cereal plant was most used by a culture. To the English, corn was wheat. In Scotland and Ireland, corn was oats. And when European settlers came to the Americas, they found the inhabitants growing what they called Indian corn, or maize, as their dominant cereal plant. Although European settlers in the New World encountered popcorn in Central and South America, there's actually no evidence to suggest that popcorn was present at the first American Thanksgiving in Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1621. Instead, popcorn as we know it today would find its way to North American East Coast as Valparaiso corn, brought up by sailors and whalers from the Chilean port of Valparaiso, recorded as early as 1820. Within a few years, it became known as what we call today, popcorn, an Americanism that shortened the words popped corn. With the invention of wire poppers, popcorn quickly spread throughout the United States. But it was industrialization that would cement popcorn forever in the American culinary heritage. At the Columbian Expo in Chicago in 1893, inventor Charles Creeters introduced the world's first mobile popcorn machine, a simple steam engine attached to a peanut cart that cooked popcorn in a mixture of butter and lard. At the same expo, F.W. Ruckheim introduced a molasses-flavored candied corn with peanuts, the first caramel corn. It was a little bit too sticky for most people, so the Ruckheim brothers altered the recipe and packaged it as Cracker Jack in 1896. With Creeder's mobile popcorn machine and Cracker Jack, popcorn became a staple of the American social experience. By the 1920s, popcorn was everywhere, at sporting events, circuses, carnivals, parks, bars, everywhere you could think of, except the movie theater.
The movie palaces of the 1920s were fighting a PR battle with the baldry Nickelodeons. Movie theaters wanted to create an image of class and sophistication, so they copied the style of traditional theaters with sweeping architectures of grand lobbies and furnishing them with elegant crystal chandeliers and gorgeous carpets. The movies were too refined, too good for the common man's snack, and owners didn't want to deal with the mess and the aroma of popcorn in their their immaculate halls. But technology and economics change everything. The most important shift in film technology was the addition of synchronized sound. After 1927, you could actually hear what the actors were saying on screen instead of being required to read title cards. This opened up the movies to brand new audiences, people who were illiterate, often the poor, and young children. Audiences that weren't really attracted to the palatial settings of movie palaces. And then came the Great Depression. Many movie palaces went under, and those that survived were clinging on to dear life. Everyone in the movie business was suffering, except for the street vendors who were proving that there was a buttery gold mine in popcorn. Popcorn was a cheap luxury that people could still afford and became the first snack smuggled under coats into movie theaters. See, in this dark economic time, you could actually make a living as a popcorn street vendor. Example, an Oklahoma banker who lost his shirt in the stock market crash resorted to selling popcorn in front of a movie theater. Within a couple years, he made back enough money to buy back his house, buy a farm, and even a store. Another example of the money in popcorn involves Kemmons Wilson, a young kid who dropped out of high school to support his family. He struck a deal with a Memphis movie theater to sell popcorn outside the theater to patrons as they were going in. He bought a machine for $50 on credit and began selling bags for five cents each. In not too much time, he was making $40 to $50 a week. A lot of money in those times considering the movie theater was struggling to pull in 25. Jealous, the movie theater owner kicked Wilson out and moved into the popcorn business himself. Well, the story does have a happy ending, as Kemmons Wilson vowed to own his own theater so no one would ever take his popcorn machine away again. And he did just that a few years after he founded Holiday Inn. The independent, non-studio-owned theaters were the first on board the popcorn gravy train. R.J. McKenna, a manager that ran a chain of theaters in the West, began selling popcorn inside the movie theater lobby, where the buttery aroma boosted sales. By 1938, he was collecting over $200,000 in proceeds. For that kind of money, who cares if their carpets got messed up? Another chain on the East Coast experimented with popcorn only in their smaller theaters, keeping the nicest, fanciest theaters concession-free. Those that sold popcorn were making a profit, whereas the fancy theaters were dipping into the red. Popcorn was literally saving the movie theater business, so much so that a Depression-era entrepreneur once gave this bit of advice. Find a good place to sell popcorn and then build a movie theater around it. Popcorn continued its growth in American pop culture, especially during World War II when sugar rations made candy and chocolate scarce. But popcorn, like the movies, would face a serious challenger in the new entertainment technology of the 1950s, television. A television was the last straw in a crumbling studio system in the late 40s and 50s. Movie attendance dropped as much as 50% inside the decade, along with popcorn sales. The problem with popcorn was it was hard to make at home and in small servings. But as the movies turned to new technology to lure audiences back into theaters, the popcorn industry turned to technology to make popcorn at home. Brands like Easy Pop in 1955 and Jiffy Pop in 1959 sold packaged unpopped kernels in disposable aluminum pans that would expand during cooking. Despite patent violation lawsuits, Jiffy Pop would go on to become the standard for home-cooked popcorn for a generation. But it was another piece of technology that would make popcorn the perfect companion for a night in with a movie, the microwave oven. 
Raytheon Manufacturing Corporation was a company based out of Massachusetts that made radio tubes for consumer use. During World War II, the British approached them to mass produce an electronic component called a magnetron to be used in their secret weapon, radar. Raytheon ended up producing over 80% of all magnetrons used by the Allied forces, shooting their income from $6 million a year in 1942 up to $173 million by the war's end. But the executives faced a serious problem. What could they do with all these magnetrons once hostilities ceased? In late 1945, a Raytheon engineer and inventor named Percy Spencer brought the patent attorney into the lab for a demonstration. He set up a microwave tube and dropped a kernel of popcorn in front of the waveguide. It popped, creating the world's first microwaved popcorn. Within two years, the first commercially produced microwave oven was introduced, standing about six feet tall, weighing 750 pounds and costing between $2,000 and $3,000. Perhaps a bit big and a bit expensive for most families, but a couple of decades of refinement would eventually result in a smaller countersized model and the microwave popcorn boom would take hold in the 1980s, just in time for the popularization of premium cable and watch at home movie technologies like VHS, Beta, and LaserDisc. For some, the movie going experience is simply incomplete without a bucket of buttery yellow popcorn. The tie is not only a personal and cultural connection, it's actually a very important economic one as well. Popcorn pulled movie theaters from bankruptcy during the Great Depression, and the concessions account for as much as half of the profit generated by a movie theater today, more so than the actual ticket price, which has to be shared with the movie studio distributors. By charging that outrageous and frankly insane markup we pay at the concessions, the movie theater can keep ticket prices lower to attract more patrons and make up for it by selling snacks and treats. Ultimately, it is this little puff of air and starch that is responsible for keeping movies in business. For without popcorn, there simply would be no theaters and perhaps no movies, at least not in the way that we know them. Whether you partake or not, know that this simple ancient snack helped make film and filmmaking possible. Now go out there and make something great. I'm John Hess. I'll see you at filmmakeriq.com.